happy. Charge and fire. Charging. Guns charged. Firing. When we talk about the future of energy production, fusion is at the top of most people's minds, the same power that fuels the sun. But when we try and recreate it on Earth, it seems to be perpetually 30 years away. A wave of scientists and startups are racing to change that, and I got to visit First Light Fusion HQ in Oxford, who are aiming to have operational fusion power by the end of the decade. What I want to show you is a bit of what is actually happening behind the scenes to meet some of the team that is working together to hopefully enable human beings to master the power of the sun. But first, let me give you a bit of context. The recent fusion breakthrough that you might have read about from the NIF used lasers to compress hydrogen isotope fuel to the point that it ignited and released energy. First Light Fusion are working on a similar compression approach, but rather than using lasers, they are using a projectile fired at 60 kilometers per second. That's so fast, it could make a full loop of the Earth in about 10 minutes. I joined the team on a day when they were testing one of their guns, but I'll explain a little bit more about that in a minute. I first met Ryan, he's their COO, who you might actually recognize because he's a Navy ex-submariner and was called up by basically every news outlet out there to talk about the Ocean Gate submarine disaster. Is the rowing machine for in case the fusion power stops working. The first thing I wanted to see was the gun, which First Light affectionately refers to as the BFG. I'll let you fill in what that stands for, which is how they test parts of their fusion design. So Ryan introduced me to Nick. Nick is the founder and CEO of First Light Fusion, and Nick took me on a tour and explained to me how the BFG actually works. The first stage uses gunpowder, and that launches the first projectile, which comes down this tube here. This is the first projectile, uh, which we call uh, the piston. We call it the piston because it compresses hydrogen gas ahead of it in this tube. Um, and that piston slams into what's called the central breach here, which is this very, very thick, chunky piece of steel. In here, there's a conical section, which takes the bore size down from the piston to the projectile. So this is the size of the, the second projectile. So the piston gets to normal gun velocities, so about three times the speed of sound or one kilometer per second. Yeah. This gets to up to seven kilometers per second and whatever multiple the speed of sound that is. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and it, can, it does that because um, uh, hydrogen, being the lightest gas, has the highest speed of sound and can expand most quickly. So this is being pushed by hydrogen, it can get to much higher velocity. But you can't really get to much faster than eight or nine kilometers per second, and to get to like energy gain without approach we need something like 60 so it's just it's not possible to do it with this but it allows us to test the target. I think this is the uh, aftermath and then this is what it comes out looking like afterwards yeah so yeah and another reason why we wouldn't do this in a power plant is you have to get that back out and like reset and stuff so I mean it's I don't know if it's impossible but <laughs> So what are First Light actually doing here? Their approach to fusion is called projectile fusion. It's a type of confinement fusion. To unlock the power of fusion, you have to drive light atoms, usually isotopes of hydrogen, together at ultra high pressures and fuse light atoms into heavier ones, also producing energy in the form of fast neutrons. This compressive force needs to be uniform around the fuel, but First Light here have a unique challenge. They only exert force from one side of their fuel and this is where these guys are absolute geniuses but I'll explain how they achieve it in a moment. First I had a simpler question, how do they hold back the pressure of the hydrogen gas in the first chamber so that it can build up to ultimately accelerate that second projectile? Luckily I found someone that could answer that. So it's one of our gun techs. That's me. Pleasure. Cool title. Yeah. <laughs> Both ex maybe guys. Okay so, awesome. Um, it feel in good hands. Yeah. yeah. So unfortunately the gun's quite covered up at the minute. Yeah, okay. Uh, some safety features that we've put in place, uh, learning from other people's mistakes. Okay. <laughs> I thought it was best not to ask Sam what he actually meant here. Okay. Our projectile sits about here. It's cool. And uh, whenever all that gas is being compressed about 10,000 bar, then what we have is our burst disc. So once it reaches 10,000 bar, that disc will burst. And then that will launch our projectile down right. our launch tube. So that entire compressive force of the 10,000 bar of hydrogen pressure is held back by that small metal plate that only bursts once the 10,000 bar has been reached. That hydrogen then accelerates the secondary projectile. 
Before we could go much deeper, we were called back to the control room so the gun could be prepped for firing. Inside the control room were about six to seven people, all with different responsibilities, but most of them were there, focused on capturing data from the shot. And why are you actually shooting today? At what? At what are we shooting? Yeah. Uh, so I can't maybe give... High level. <laughs> yeah, Non-confidential well, yeah, high level. Exactly. Um, <laughs> it's basically, we're shooting a projectile against an amplifier. Okay. And the amplifier takes the input energy and shapes that input shock down in space and time and creates a very focused point, which then uh, releases. If it was a fusion experiment, that would release into fuel. Yeah. And in this case, we're releasing into nothing. We, we, we place uh, imaging on one side. Gotcha. Uh, yeah. So you're trying to perfect the amplifier exactly. design, it's, basically. It's, it's what we call a, a diagnostic variant. Of, of it's a, a catchy title. Yeah. yeah. Cool. <laughs> but I wanted to know a little bit more about how you actually go about capturing data from an event that happens so quickly and is over almost instantaneously. On the front face, we have what we call ionization pins. And so when that impact happens, they get triggered, releases an electrical signal to this scope, which spits out a signal and triggers all the cameras. And everything. Awesome. Cool. Um, and we input delays here. So we expect the time between <laughs> impacts and the event to be around two microseconds. Mm -hmm. So that's why we've bunched all of the imaging detection side yeah. around that time. So what's actually happening here? They're trying to collect data from their experiment, but everything happens incredibly quickly. We'll hear in a second that these data sets are already very difficult to collect. After the projectile impacts the amplifier, about two microseconds, that's about two millionths of a second pass before the interesting data of the event that they actually want to measure actually happens. That event is over in a few hundred nanoseconds. That's a few 10 millionths of a second. So what they're doing is they're triggering their recording from the moment of impact, but then only actually collecting data after an appropriate delay. And keep in mind, this system is the slow system at just seven kilometers a second rather than 60 kilometers a second. So they're being really smart here in splitting up what experiments they're actually doing where. Can you tell me that again? Timex is, uh up to a billion frames a second, but it will only take 16 frames because um, it's got a very low memory. In case you missed it, this camera that they are using takes a billion frames per second, but only has enough space for 16 frames. A billion frames per second is one frame every nanosecond. In a nanosecond, a beam of light moves about one foot. So if you use this camera on a beam of light, you could watch it move foot by foot down a corridor ludicrously quick. So you have to time it yeah, ultra perfect. Right. Timing is very important. How often do you fire a shot and fail to capture what it is you were looking to capture? Uh, it depends. Normally, if it does, it'll be on the first shot of the campaign because it's always you trying to find, you know, get your timings right and stuff like that. And this is this is the first shot of the campaign. Just to, just to warn you. <laughs> Foreshadowing. So Emilio's had to take a bit of a guess about the brightness settings on his camera. Brightness could be anything from nothing to brighter than the sun. Timing, you know, it's a microsecond event, but Emilio's trying to time into a nanosecond within that microsecond window. And we never get it right first shot. If we do, he's going to the pub, but yeah. Um, all our hopes are on Emilio. Yeah. yeah. Okay, <laughs> awesome. Fingers crossed. Okay, cool. <laughs> so all of this energy is being put into measuring what actually happened when you shoot the fusion target and the amplifier with these projectiles. And it is this amplifier that really is the key behind First Light Fusion's approach to fusion because it allows them to take a comparatively slow moving projectile. And yes, you heard me right, 60 kilometers per second is slow compared to the speeds needed for fusion and amplify and distribute that force to a sufficient power that it can ignite fusion. The design of this, I always love this fact, the design of this was originally inspired by nature by the pistol shrimp, which can close one of its claws so fast that it causes cavitation in the water, it essentially causes the water to spontaneously boil and form a bubble the temperature inside that bubble can get to something like 5,000 degrees. And if you look at the amplifier that First Light produces, it is specially designed to transform the force of the incoming projectile into a uniform force around the fuel. We were testing a new type of amplifier which um, boosts the pressure but also shapes the shock waves. So it delivers, instead of delivering a flat shock, it delivers a hemispherical shock on the output of that amplifier. And that's where we're working because we have designs which take an impact from just one side and turn it into a fully wrapped around spherical implosion of the fuel capsule. 
Turning a one-sided force into an equal 360 degree coverage compressive force is quite the trick, but it really is the core to everything behind what First Light Fusion is trying to achieve. Actually, it's one-sidedness, which is the most important property of our approach. So like, we could use a laser. If laser costs were to fall, we may well switch to that. We still have a much simpler power plant because it's the one-sidedness which makes the power plant simpler to engineer. And it's that focus on the reactor, the actual power plant for fusion as the end goal that is really important. This gun isn't capable of producing the projectile speed sufficient for energy gain in fusion. So while the gun is useful for studying the amplifier designs, Nick showed me next door to where they are designing early prototypes of a scalable fusion power plant. This is uh, machine three. So this is um, our biggest pulsed power machine. Uh, so pulsed power, basically what that means is you store energy in capacitors. So the big blue boxes are capacitors. Um, and then you discharge that energy very, very quickly. So this is why it's called pulsed power. You make a pulse of electrical energy which comes out. So the capacitors here charge up in about um, 60 seconds, but they discharge in about two millionths of seconds. Um, so that's the pulse compression which is delivered. Um, and then this, this is the way that we launch our um, high velocity projectile. And that's how our approach to inertial fusion works. There's always a thing in inertial fusion which is kind of like a spark plug in an engine which supplies the spark which makes the fuel burn and you get this big pulse of energy released. So just like in an internal combustion engine, you add fuel into the system, you ignite it, you capture the energy that it releases through that explosion, you reset the system and then you do it all again. So if the BFG wasn't up to the task of delivering the speed of projectile necessary, I wanted to understand how the team were going about trying to get to the 60 kilometers per second projectile speeds that they needed to achieve. So coming up onto the top then, we can see more clearly a bit like how we assemble the load into the, into the chamber. Um, so this is an example of one of our actual projectiles. Um, so the current comes in on all sides here. Um, and it flows round and through this thing here, this thing we call the pier, because it looks like a seaside pier. And underneath, we would have a mirror image piece. So the current will flow in on the top, down through the bolt and the shim that's in there, and then back out underneath. And then there's a tiny sort of one or two millimeter gap underneath, and that's where the magnetic field is produced. And then you get this, the current flowing and the magnetic field, you get a J cross B force and a Lorentz force, so the, the projectile, like, where's that? This piece in the bottom here is the projectile. Okay. So, and it, it's, it's designed so that preferentially that piece of material is torn out from the assembly and is, and is launched upwards. Right. So everything starts moving. You know, this is just aluminium. It can't contain 500 Tesla, but the projectile moves faster and more and absorbs most of the energy. This is what it looks like when it's gone very well and we haven't had any failures, right? So that piece, the pier, has, has gone. Yeah. So all the energy was focused around to this point um, and went exactly where we wanted it to be. And all the material here has been taken out, but everything else is kind of fine. But if you actually look here, if I turn it over, oh, you get all these lovely patterns, which are just totally cool. Crazy. You can almost see where the current was flowing. Yeah, um, you can see this has got a bit of a dish on it now. So this is piece is deformed during the shot. So um, this section here we call a mechanical fuse. So it's deliberately thinned out. So we bolt it into the machine here and it's designed to break at this point and it doesn't transmit the force back into the machine basically. So this is one which has come out deformed. Sometimes it comes out completely severed and it's just this middle disc is taken out. Um, so again, sort of thinking through to kind of a power plant. Yeah, we have to replace this component every time. And that is a, a, a kind of a remote handling and design mechanical engineering challenge we have consciously accepted. Yeah. And that probably is the biggest challenge we have in our power plant it actually is doing this. So an amazing, but arguably pretty complicated launch system. And I'd seen questions on previous coverage of First Light's approach that really just asked the question of, well, why aren't they just using a rail gun? Something that's simpler and easier and probably could be reused rather than destroying itself after each shot. Well, this kind of is like a rail gun in many senses. This is gonna sound very, very abstract. Short rail gun. It's a very short rail gun. It's gonna sound quite abstract, but like there's a requirement for a rail gun which we have 
decided to okay. not adopt. So okay. the requirement is the rails survive okay. and you can do another shot later with the same rails. Okay. That means that your magnetic forces have to be less than the material strength of these rails, which is a limit. Yeah. And then because the forces are lower, the distance you have to accelerate over is much longer. So you end up with these rail guns which are like 20 meters long, and that's how you get to the velocity. Yeah. If you say, well, actually, I don't care about the rails surviving more than one shot. If I'm just, I'm just going to make it all in one go and shoot it, and then I'll replace the whole lot. Yeah. That takes you to a completely different place because you don't just go through that limit by a factor of two. You go through that limit by a factor of like 10,000 wow, yeah. and you end up with incredible insane forces and acceleration in like this distance. It sounds like you're wasting a lot of money disposing of these rails every time, but the rails get tiny too. So then it doesn't cost that much. I love the combination of smart, cost-effective engineering, really understanding the problem and finding where the critical technical as well as cost challenges are in realizing something as complicated as a fusion reactor. I hope it's clear to you now that this place is like Willy Wonka's factory for physicists and engineers. And I really wanted to see as much as possible under the hood of M3. There's a few pieces we can look at. So first, first these are the capacitors. So um, there are two capacitors in um, parallel, um, and then they're connected into um, a switch here. So um, there's 192 capacitors in the whole machine. There's half that number of switches. All the switches all close synchronously, simultaneously, and they all the capacitors all discharge to launch one projectile. Yeah. So like if we go under here, then this is the switch underneath. Okay. So it's got this case over the top. And this kind of like blue squid octopus thing is feeding dry air into the middle of the switch. So what this is, is a, is a spark gap switch. And the, the current is literally flowing through the air inside that switch. And it's dry air so that it's a controlled set of properties. And if we go back out to the bench, I can show you the inside of one of these things. So this is the, the inside of that spark gap switch. So we'll have 100 kilovolts of charge up here and ground down here and that that voltage is being held off by basically the fact that the air air is an insulator right okay. so it's so it doesn't it doesn't break down it doesn't conduct yeah. um, then there's these set of balls in here and through here there's a, a hole so we pass a trigger cable through there and basically we put um, a pulse an electrical pulse through the trigger cable that disturbs the electrical fields and that makes it break down and conduct, right? Um, so each one of these switches in this machine is taking about um, 50 kiloamps of, of current. Um, so this switch which I'm holding is something like 10 lightning bolts going through this. <laughs> okay. um, yeah. And so this one you do want survivable, which is why it's, you're engineering. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So this is actually one of the challenges for the long term. So the way inertial fusion works in a power plant is it's a pulse process and you have to do it in our design, you do it once every 90 seconds. Okay. Um, that means we need this machine or a machine like it to fire once every 90 seconds. Now that's totally possible from the point of view of like charging and discharging it. But the problem is you're going to screw this yeah. in like a thousand shots, which is going to be something like an hour, you know. So you need one of these which is going to last for, if you get up to sort of 10 million shots, then that's, that's fine. These kinds of machines, they're normally built by national labs and they don't really have the risk tolerance to like try that. Sure, yeah. And we kind of need to decide if we do or not because the capacitors are actually on the critical path for our next machine, machine four, yeah. which will be our gain demonstrator. And if you think this is big, the um, present design for machine four is fully 70, 72 meters across. It's an absolute monster. <laughs> but, it, but it's very similar. Instead of having 192 of these, uh, the current design has 6,600. So just to make that clear, BFG is the gun that we saw for testing amplifier design, but it isn't fast enough to actually build a reactor around. M3 is First Light's current prototype where they are learning how to accelerate projectiles to the speeds that they need and how to run a reactor. M4 will be their first facility capable of gain experiments, which means getting more energy out than they put in. Then beyond that, they'll probably start building pilot reactors that actually produce electricity. Have a look underneath there. Um, do you just watch your head. <laughs> So this is the this is the target chamber, and I, I've just 
bumped into the back of it, so uh, that means that the shirt has to go in the wash probably. <laughs> you can see it's pretty filthy. Um, so yeah, we run this machine, this is an experimental platform for testing the physics, right? So we, we run this um, once every two days when we're kind of going for it, basically. That's the standard turnaround. Um, in, a, in a power plant, we need to do this once every 90 seconds. So all of this stuff which you see above us here, like, I mean, look at the number of bolts in this thing, yeah. right? You can't have bolts yeah. to put a piece in if you've got 90 seconds. Yeah. But it's it's not rocket science either. You just have to have like a pneumatic clamping kind of system or something, right? So the frequency which we're talking about once every 90 seconds, it, it's it's like car assembly line technology that we need in order to do this remote handling of getting the next load in, installed, taking the old one out. And again, this is like this principle we've been working with like right from the start. We've always been thinking about the physics and the engineering together. Um, and the other approaches to inertial fusion, they're talking about more like 10 times per second. And that's a, that's a very different level of challenge. Yeah, that's talking about you know, you have to put the target into the device at like two kilometers per second. Like you have to fire it out of a gun to get it into the chamber at the right speed. And that's not what we're talking about here. Yeah. Wow. Um, is this all just uh, like carbon charring or what? So all of this carbon, all of the plastic that we use in the target gets turned into carbon and hydrogen, CH, and all the carbon ends up on the chamber. Um, and again, this is sort of, we are learning things here which will matter for the power plant engineering. So like you might think that having a chamber this dirty, if you know anything about vacuum chambers, you might think this is a big problem. Actually, from our just experience, it turns out, no. Actually, we think the carbon is, the carbon soot that's being deposited on the surface is actually kind of filling in the sort of micro cracks in the chamber and almost like annealing the surface in some kind of way, which actually means we get great quality vacuum here. Amazing. Uh, so usually below there is a bottom plate that kind of... So below there's a, there's a lid which is over here and you can actually see um, again you know, learning stuff now which is useful for later. We know quite a lot about debris shielding uh, in this system. Um, it's absolutely filthy. Um, but yeah, keeping everything healthy, uh, we've got quite experienced at. So if, if we were to punch a hole through the actual vacuum chamber, um, we'd be talking kind of a six month downtime to get a new chamber. So it really matters to us to get this right and you know, touch, touch wood, but uh, we have not had a whole punch through the chamber. <laughs> and uh, just why is it so important to do it under vacuum? Um, so it's, it's actually, you might think it's to do with removing the air resistance or something like that from the projectile, but it's, it's not really that. It's actually about the, the pulse power itself. Um, so the, the currents and electric fields we're creating in the load are, are so high that we need that, that vacuum um, uh, so that we don't get arcing and sparking all over the place, basically. So if, you, if, we, if we fired this in air, we'd probably see you know, mini lightning bolts just everywhere. Whereas if we do it in vacuum, then there's no, it's much better insulation, basically. Oh, I didn't look important. It's okay. Okay, so slight excursion, but I hope you thought seeing deep behind the scenes of this fusion approach was worth the wait. Now, back to the BFG. Gun's dangerous. Happy? Good, okay, so I'm going to isolate the chamber controls and turn on nitrogen. Happy? Charge and fire. Charging. Gun's charged. Firing. Do you remember how I said foreshadowing earlier and that the first shot of the campaign never works? Did, did we catch it? Uh, it doesn't look like it. If you look on the screen here, um, we've got completely blank everything. Yeah. So, unfortunately, uh, the first shot on the campaign. Not today. No. <laughs> but this, this is this is science, you know. That is science. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't always work first time. <laughs> no, exactly. Okay, well, we'll come back next time when you uh, got it all tuned in. Absolutely. But ten minutes later, they called us back into the control room. Yeah. So basically, I thought immediately after the shot that we didn't have any data, but that wasn't quite true. Okay. I hadn't looked through uh, this particular camera, and I hadn't changed the light levels on this one. Okay. So if we play from the beginning, we see nothing, uh, which is as expected because the time base on this camera is huge compared to the other ones. Um, we have 256 frames at uh, 
what is it, 100 nanoseconds between each frame. And the event itself lasts only a matter of between 100 and 200 nanoseconds. So we see this kind of flash here where we have nothing and then suddenly this, um, this uh, amplifier is releasing in this direction towards us, the bright flash, and then after two frames, nothing. Uh. And we, if we look at this, this uh, camera here, the time between each frame is now 30 nanoseconds rather than 100 nanoseconds. But the issue with this camera is it's much more light hungry. So we, t we turn the gamma right, right down. We can see kind of similar stuff to what we saw on this, mm -hmm. but higher time resolution. Unfortunately, you can see that the image moved up slightly during the, the, ch uh, the chamber vacuum down. So we've missed a bit of the data. But for a first shot, we're really happy with it. Got him. Yeah. Redeemed. Exactly. Cool. So, so yeah, we're happy. Good. Yeah. Trips to the pub tonight then. Absolutely. Maybe. Okay, <laughs> awesome. And that's science. Sometimes you get it, sometimes you kind of get it, and sometimes you don't get it at all. Today, we kind of got it. Uh, I want to thank Nick, I want to thank Emilio, I want to thank Ryan, I want to thank Sam for showing us around First Light Fusion and everyone else that was involved that I got time to kind of interact with. Uh, this was cool. This was probably one of my favorite experiences of something that I've gone and had the opportunity to visit and just see the absolute cutting edge and people solving problems that no one in the world has solved yet. But one more cool thing happened. That's the bar from this shot that you can have. Oh, amazing. Cool, thank you. Much appreciated, man. Have a good one. This is a piece of fusion history. Uh, this is the plate that held back the hydrogen in this particular shot. I was thinking about potentially sending this to someone in the comment section, but then I was like, does anyone want me to send a sharp piece of scrap metal to them in the post? I don't know. I'll be the judge based on the comments that you leave down below. Uh, thank you for watching. I will see you guys next time. Oh wait, I meant to say we got merch. It's scientists in the style of rock band t-shirts with their accomplishments and their tour dates on the back. How cool is that? I'll leave a link in the description down below. Thank you very much for watching. I will see you guys next time. Bye.